Loloma, uh, this is Gabriel Yaiba. We're out here at Waltby, Arizona, one of the oldest continuously inhabited civilizations in North America. And we're doing this as part of um, the Elders Video Recording Project, which is kind of uh, co-sponsored by um, the Grand Canyon Trust and Native Movement Peace and Balance. And what we're doing is um, using technology to build a bridge between elders and youth groups, and build that rapport. Native American problems aren't just narrow ones of jobs and job skills, but broad ones of cultural disintegration. They've been told for so long that their language and everything else about their culture are worthless that they believe it. Jared Diamond. When the Europeans came here, they already had the unhealthy qualities of racism inside them. You look at the Arab world and uh, the Europeans are bump bumping heads over there now. United States got in and they bump heads. But what started it was the Pope of the church made a decree that if they don't listen to you, you can take their land and you can kill them. Genocide came from that Pope. Racism. That was the first crusade into the Middle East. There were three more. It was in the 1300s. That began before the white man came here, thinking that I can do whatever I want to do. And if you don't believe the way I believe, I can take your land, I can take your house, I can kill you. When Christopher Columbus came here in 1492, there was a high a debate in the Spanish courts whether we were human or whether we were half human, half animal. The ones that argued we were half human, half animal was the majority opinion. They had a mentality that we weren't human beings, that we didn't have a language, we didn't have a spiritual faith, we didn't have a homeland, we didn't have an educational system, we didn't have an economy. We had all that, but they said, you're not human. So from the four crusades, the Pope decreed, and from the Spanish court debate over that is the beginning of racism here in Turtle Island. Tell you what they did. To their children said they sent them away for an education But in reality it was separation Setting them up total destruction Forced them to speak in their own tongue Unremitting pressure, total submission Cut off their hair for no identity Leading to personal devastation They were so abused in those schools And, you know, the whole, the whole attitude was to beat the Indian out of the Indian. There's a slap of the hand, there's detention, there's, you know, punishment for not doing things in exact way. Whereas in the Indian way, grandma and grandpa tell you stories and it's your family teaching you and you're out running and playing in the, in the environment. You sat down with um, an uncle, a grandparent, auntie, your parents and and it took a human relationship where, where you listen. And, and education were the basis of, you know, real deep turmoil and struggle between our people. Potbella uh, during the 50s and up to current time to the point where families and clans and members in the village were split in half, brothers and sisters, mothers and fathers, aunts and uncles, clan relatives, because we were taught and instructed to live a simple life Anything that was relative to you know, modern technology or education that wasn't pertinent to our Hopi way of life through the rites of uh, passage that we had to go through, through the Hopi customs and traditions of Third Mesa, presented customs and traditions of Third uh, Turmoil to uh, those who were related with each other and to the whole community. People were uh, named uh, progressive, 
those that acquiesce to the federal government and their uh, ways of education and instructions and ways of living versus those who wanted to live Hopi way of life, which was a simple way of life for the instructions of the caregiver of this uh, world, the fourth world that we live in, and his name was Masa. He told us that if we want to live with him upon this land, we have to live a simple life of agriculture, respecting and taking care of the earth, living off our hard uh, labor uh, by the sweat of our toils. The ones that were friendly to the U.S. government uh, education and means of life were called the friendlies. The hostiles were vastly the religious leaders of the different uh, religious societies and were taken away to uh, federal installations like Alcatraz, Mount Lemmon uh, to do hard time. It relates directly to the issues of acceptance of uh, modern ways of living, modern technology. The true Hopi religious uh, leadership's uh, desire to live the way that they wanted to in a non-violent, peaceful way. And so when they were accosted and arrested and put into prisons, uh, they uh, didn't react violently. Uh, rather, they stood their ground as many times as they tempted them with uh, gifts of food, building new houses and uh, facilities for themselves and their families. They refused the atrocities that they had to uh, go through, they, they told me that they were chained up in uh, chain gangs of six uh, made to eat food that was tainted with soap. When one person got uh, dysentery, all of them had to go at the same time. People, our relatives, our uncles, our grandfathers who you know, went through those atrocities and uh, lived to tell about uh, those situations to us because in the next generations, uh, they might not be as fortunate to have had that contact. And, and they don't, because those people are gone. When conquerors and colonizers attempt to take control of indigenous peoples, eradicate their culture, and make it criminal for them to speak their languages, the result is social and economic devastation and the loss of rich living cultures. When they came back to the reservations, traditional communities that were there wouldn't accept these kids. They weren't accepted in the Euro-American mainstream community. They turned to drug and alcohol to escape. Then they started having kids, and they were getting married. And it was just this kind of ongoing, almost like a snowball effect. I was raised by a pack of jackals with rabies. It was uh, very violent, alcoholic family, the typical, you know, Indian, everybody's screaming, yelling, pain, confusion, chaos, uh, drama, violence, definitely dysfunctional. I told myself I would never become like these people. I ended up becoming the worst one of all through some very poor choices, getting caught up in these addictions to illusions that I thought were solutions. The road that they took me down was filled with you know, darkness and despair. I started drinking at a very, very, very young age. And to see 13-year-olds walking around drunk that I have seen at parties, it just breaks my heart to know that somebody's seen me that way. The combination of you know peer pressure, uh, look like the thing to do. If one person would have said, Greg, what you're doing is wrong, instead of saying, here, have a drink, they handed it to me instead of taking it away. If one person would have done that for me, you know, there's no time where I'd be today. I was on a death wish and I did not want to live because of the self-loathing. And the memory of hurting my children the way I did is what's right here. I came home one time to do some laundry. I saw my dad's truck out there. I started calling out to him and, and he wasn't answering. And 
At the time, I had, I had been involved with uh, methamphetamine, which is speed, and it uh, has a tendency to, you know, heighten the senses of awareness, you know, through sleep deprivation or whatever. I heard this sound in the house that sounded like a, a rocking chair on a, on a wooden porch that was, or a squeaky hinge in the, in the wind. It was like, ee, ee. And I heard that sound and I could not find it and I'm like, whatever, so I gave up. I went into the garage to do the laundry and uh, it was my dad swinging on a rope. It was purple and his face and his lips were white and I slammed the door. And I said, you know, I'm, I'm hallucinating now. Now I'm seeing things. You need to rest your neck and take a nap. I started walking away, and then I wondered, you know, wonder if that's real. So I went back there and opened the door, and sure enough, he was still there. I wore a buck knife at the time, and I cut him down, and he was still alive. He's down on the ground, I'm kind of cradling him in my arms, and the first thing out of his mouth is, get me a beer. About four months after that, I came home and, and nobody was there. My mom's car was there. I smelled propane. Went into the motorhome and sure enough, the gas is on and my mom's laid out. So I called 911, dragged her out. And they said if you had been a little bit later, she would not be with us now. So I had this message or image of it's okay to kill yourself. These people hated themselves enough to actually want to do something about it. I was raised Catholic with this uh, guilt, trip, fear thing about if you kill yourself, you go to hell and all that thing. I hated myself just as much and wanted to die, but I couldn't somehow pull myself to, to do it myself. So I put myself in situations where I could surely die. I did my drugs, I did the alcohol. I did the abusive relationships, and I've learned from them, and I turned it around and become the person that I am today. It's because of that dancing that I was able to learn more about my culture. <laughs> Because what I wear when I dance is a story. I, I miss seeing the old ways, but yet I'm happy that they are having the powwows and they, I'm glad they adapted it. To see those young men around the drum and singing, knowing that they're not going to get paid. <laughs> And sit around a drum and they sing and they have and then some of them bring their families you know mom and dad and uncles and aunties are all there <laughs> then the older ones that bring the mom dads aunties and uncles that bring the little babies to come and dance and I'd rather see them there than running the mall or running around Walmart spending money. You know, they're there. You could have a big rainstorm and they'll stay until the rainstorm leaves. I can think of examples of artists right now that I know who have done that whole thing, you know, the drugs, the alcohol, the women, and then have gone back to their communities and reconnected. And it's changed their lives. I've been told by a at least one that he feels whole again. And he came home and reconnected. He also pulled his brother out of this kind of morass and got his brother back too. And, and the two of them are really successful artists right now. I mean, you can't get near them at Indian Market. People camping out all night in their booths. And it's because they pulled it together. They were not successful when they were drinking and doing drugs and partying all the time. Get back to your roots because that's going to tell you why you're where you are right now. Get reconnected because that's who you are. We call this the Bridge Project.